Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the special meeting of council to order. Welcome to the 8th, uh, April 8th special meeting of council. I'd like to first recognize that we are in the traditional territory of the Samic First Nation. Our clerk tonight will be Ms. Sheila Gurry, uh, who's going to have already had a long day and it will get longer. Uh, the question period sign-up sheet is on the partition wall uh, near the gallery. If during the meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, would you please write down your name and the agenda item on that sheet? And at the start of question period, I'll call up those who've signed up to the podium to address council. Uh, and the first item on the agenda is the introdu introduction of late items, Ms. Gurry. None, I gather? There's no late items, Your Worship. A motion for the approval of the agenda. Councillor Thorpe, seconded Councillor uh, Bonner. All those in favor? Motion carried. Motion for the adoption of the minutes that have been circulated. There's no minutes, actually, Your Worship. Sorry about that. Oh, there are none. You're right. Goodness. Uh, Mayor's report. Uh, well, we're going to have a late Superintendent Miller if I don't say something, so perhaps I should just lapse into some chatter for a little while. <laughs> Well, I, I hope he's out fighting crime and defending the uh, citizens of Nanaimo in the circumstances. Yes, Mr. Rudolph's going to uh, ride to the rescue here. Uh, in, in terms of uh, a mayor's report, um, I think uh, most of you know next week, uh, members of council, many of them will be attending the AVICC in Powell River, uh, which is a gathering of all the uh, local politicians uh, for the Vancouver Island community, including Powell River and the Sunshine Coast. Uh, and it's an opportunity for us, obviously, to uh, interact with our colleagues, but also to uh, exchange views on a number of issues that are relevant to uh, what are all smaller communities, essentially. We are not the big smoke of Vancouver or Richmond or Burnaby. Uh, and a good opportunity to do networking, to see that there are things that we can do that uh, cooperatively will assist in uh, keeping down our taxes, protecting our environment and ensuring that uh, good practices are adopted across the, uh, across the board. Now, um, Ms. Gurry, is there any reason that uh, we can't hear from one of the delegations Not first? At all. No, Your Worship, um, I was actually going to suggest you move on with item seven and listen to delegations A and B and when and if um, I, officer in charge, Cameron Miller. Oh, he is here? Okay. Well, I, I, I think we'll uh, I think we'll defer to uh, Superintendent Miller if he's coming. Up. There he is. <laughs> I, 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 isn't that the title of a book, Superintendent Miller? I heard the owl call my name, except it's the mayor this time. <laughs> Welcome, Superintendent Miller. He's going to provide us with a quarterly review uh, and council priorities report. So good afternoon, Your Worship, Councillors. Uh, as I've mentioned before, I'd like to do a quarterly update just to give you a uh, state of the nation where we are with policing and where we are with the uh, services and a few other things I'd like to cover off today. So today's presentation, um, I'd like to go over our current policing pressures, various statistics that the RCMP has had over the past year, and what our policing priorities are for 2019-2020. So first off, starting with our current policing pressures. Uh, increase for calls for service at temporary shelters. I think everybody's aware of that. Uh, we've had an increase in overall homelessness. And we've noticed now, our bike patrol unit, who's on the street regularly, have noticed that the number of homeless people is starting to grow already. And it used to be that this number wouldn't start to increase until May. We started to see a spike already in February. We know we had a very warm and mild March. Uh, and the numbers are starting to go up. Where well, we had about 400 in our last point in time count last year, we're estimating now this summer, if the trend continues, we'll be around 500 homeless people this summer. Also, one of our current policing pressures increased in fatal motor vehicle accidents, and we'll cover off our traffic statistics uh, a little bit later. So our first temporary uh, housing shelter, as you know, is at Labio Place, 2600 Labio Road. That's by the city works yard, and you can see a diagram there of where the temporary shelter is. 
Second temporary shelter at Newcastle Place at 250 Terminal Avenue. This one's managed by Island Crisis Care, the other one managed by Pacifica, who we have relationships with. Now, when we look at the temporary housing shelters, we um, want to know some of the issues around them from the policing point of view. These are managed by BC, or sorry, by the two agencies I mentioned, and um, funded by BC Housing. Now, I wanted to look at the calls for service, and I did bring this to Council's attention back on February 2nd when I gave a presentation. The time period I've extended now because it was back to the beginning of February, now it goes to March 25th. So we want to look at a three year, year over year over year, consistent time period from November 20th to March 25th or the three respective years. And the first uh, slide I'll show you is a pictorial one, which shows you the number of calls for the two centers. And these are calls for service in the vicinity of the temporary shelters. Now, the black line is Newcastle Place, the blue line is Labio Place, and you can see that from 2016-17 to 2017-18, there was an increase consistent with the population growth in Nanaimo and the overall crime trend we saw in the community. From 2017-18 to 2018-19, you can see that there is a very large increase, which myself as a police chief and I think the community as a whole uh, has a right to be concerned about. Looking at these in numerical things, Lavio Place, that we saw a 250% increase from 2017-18 to 2018-19. Now once again, these are calls for service. These are not necessarily uh, criminal activities. Now the percentage at Lavio, 250% uh, is a startling number, but when you look at it from the number from 217 to 803, you can see that the delta is about 500, sorry, from 2017-18 uh, to 2018-19, the delta is about 500. And when we compare this to Terminal Park, that we see from 2016-17 uh, to 2017, we had 573 calls. It goes up to 1097 in 1819. And the delta from 1718 to 1819 is pretty much the same between Labio and Terminal Park. So the number of 250 versus 66, those numbers are great. Uh, there's a great disparity there, but the actual delta of the number of calls is something you have to look at because at times when numbers are small and you have a large increase, you do get a uh, slightly skewed um, number. So just want to make sure council is aware of that, that the delta is something we're looking at for. So with these large increases numbers, something I mentioned that as chief of police, I'm not happy with the community has um, also expressed some concerns. So what are our current police activities? Once again, I have a dedicated police officer reviewing all files for each location. So anytime a file comes in, uh, that officer will review what is going on, what the file is about. Um, ongoing relationship with Island Crisis Care of Newcastle, Pacifica, at Labio. With BC Housing, we've set up community advisory committees and block watch. Now, when I talk about the ongoing relationships with Pacifica and Island Crisis Care Society, when these temporary shelters first opened up, there's a number of people moved into them and it was a new sort of dynamic within the city. There's a number of people within the shelters that were not abiding by the rules and there wasn't really an implementation plan on how to deal with it. Since that time, both of these societies, both Pacifica and Island Crisis Care, have started to evict people who are not abiding by the rules that are there, which becomes quite important to maintain a sense of normalcy within the area. As you always see, I've um, reprofiled resources now to focus on these two areas and starting a crime initiative this month to go out and to work in the area and basically this crime initiative will be uh, equivalent to an RCMP task force working on the area and it'll be extended as long as I need it. But one has to be aware if I reprofile resources from A to B, you sort of rob Peter to pay Paul. So I'm going to let something go and I'm going to monitor it obviously to see uh, where we get a spike. We're going to take resources because this is an area that's affecting the community as a whole and the reputation of the city itself. Uh, talking about traffic enforcement activities, and no presentation on traffic would be complete without the look at your statistics because they write a lot of tickets. And I'm not going to go through all these, but overall you can see 5,500 offenses were written in 2018, 2,700 being traffic tickets. So there's bylaws, park bylaws, liquor bylaws, and other type of uh, violation tickets. But when you drill down from there, the second type of uh, offenses we deal with are impaired driving statistics. And these ones cause me a lot of concern. You've got your 24-hour suspensions. You've got your three-day immediate roadside prohibitions. 
you've got your seven day roadside prohibitions and your 30 day and your 90 day roadside prohibitions. And if you look at that, we gave it 157 90 day immediate roadside prohibitions. Um, that's just too many. It really is. So we're working with ICBC on educating the public. Uh, we'll keep doing enforcement as a way to educate the public. It's not what we want, but it's a trend that's going obviously in the wrong direction. And when we look at our statistics for January and February, 931 traffic bylaw offenses were issued versus 896 in 2018, which is on trend for our growth in population, but 41 alcohol-related offenses versus 28 in 2018 for the same time period. That, once again, is a trend that we are working with more um, stop checks, more roadside checks, and simply put your worship, some of the members of our community simply aren't getting it. We've had six motor vehicle, uh, fatal motor vehicle accidents this calendar year, as of April 3rd. There's been 13 fatalities uh, in the last 12 months. Um, as I mentioned, alcohol offenses are quite distressing. But another thing that's led to some of these fatalities, uh, unfortunately, a couple of them is speed. Now, through January to March, we did 36 school zone enforcement projects, typically conducted before or after school, writing 21 tickets and 20 verbal warnings. March being distracted driving enforcement month, we issued 11 violation tickets for distracted driving in the month of March. Now, that doesn't sound a lot over 31 days, but if we take a step back, my officers are focused on concluding and working on six fatal motor vehicle accidents this year, which takes them generally off the road uh, for two to three weeks at a time. So uh, they're, middle, uh, they're in the middle of writing up one and going to another one. So it's been uh, fairly labor intensive on this one. Now another thing on the 27th and 28th of this month, uh, we did a computer enforcement blitz with Integrated Road Safety Unit. We wrote 47 uh, tickets and one warning in both those mornings, and that's over a one hour time period of each of those. So in two hours, we write 47 tickets. Uh, for those who commute in the morning, you know, around 6.30, 7.30 in the morning, the Island Highway is a freeway. That's the inland, the old one. It's not a 50 zone, it's like an 80, 90 zone. Um, signs say it's 50. I get people passing me, flipping me the bird. Unfortunately, I'm driving in my own car, so there's not a lot I can do. Um, but what I could do is I get my traffic guys out there to set up a couple of projects. And uh, we're going to keep doing this because with summer coming, increase in traffic, shorter fuses for people, we're going to end up with a pedestrian fatality. So it's my job to make sure that we get the public educated to a point where we don't do that. Um, in order to work on this, the Integrated Road Safety Unit, which is a provincial resource, they have an office here and they've got uh, a full team. And I've reached out to the province saying, I'd like them assigned here for the next uh, little while based on our numbers. And they've advised that they'll do that. So we're working with them and CVSE to set up a number of checks, stops, and just get out, get more marked units out and present and just try and slow the traffic flow down. Uh, file count per year. So the work is increasing. You can see when we start back to 2015, we're running basically just shy of 38,000 files up to just shy of 48,000 three years later. And our projection right now, if we go linear, based on what we know, we're gonna break 50,000 files this year. So um, numbers are increasing. Council has agreed to provide more resources, which will start showing up next year to help that situation. But we continue to um, have this great workload from our staff. And when we look at our file count comparison for January and February year over year, we see that our assaults are up by 83%, drug trafficking, charges up by 540%. And once again, that 540% number, skewed number, because you start off with a five and you go to a 32. Possession of stolen property, up 44 from 15, 193%. Harassments, up 132%. But the total number of criminal code files is up almost 50%. Now there's two things that this leads to. Number one, the officer is spending more time charging people, writing up crown sheets. The other thing is the burden on the court system itself because the court system itself only has so much capacity between Crown Counsel and judges, because you have to obviously have a judge, because everybody's entitled to a fair trial, and you have to have a Crown Prosecutor to pro prosecute. So the whole system itself is getting more and more encumbered. And I think if you look at what's happened in some of the largest cities in the States, 
you can maybe draw parallels to what's happening here with respect to what sort of crimes Crown Council is not willing to prosecute anymore. Obviously in the states they use district attorneys, not Crown Council, but some of our bigger cities such as Vancouver, Surrey, Toronto, there's certain things that Crown doesn't, doesn't prosecute anymore. So going forward, what is it we want to prosecute? What is it we want to look after as a community? What is it you as a council deem to be your priorities? And what I'd like to do is work with council now establishing the priorities for policing for the year 2018 or sorry, 2019, 2020. And we, what we have in the RCMP is our annual performance plan, or our APP. And we go out and identify a number of priorities that guide the detachment's focus for the coming year, where we want to profile resources, what we want to work on, what we consider important. And they're identified through a number of consultation processes, starting off with Mayor and Council of Nanaimo, Chief and Council of our First Nation communities, community groups, and others. We look at identifying five, four or five priorities because, I mean, if you have more than five priorities, you really don't have any priorities. Really. You've got to have a certain limit on what you're going to do and focus on. But each priority can have initiatives within it, and these become the goals for the given year. The initiatives we update quarterly, we send to our head office because if I write to my boss and say, hey, we're having a great day, we're catching crooks, well, he'll want to know what we're doing, what we're trying to do, what our crime trends are, and how we're going to do focus on getting our crime trends down. So look at setting initiatives and priorities. And for council's benefit, I'm gonna go over what our priorities were in 2018-19, our previous year. Our first provide, uh, priority was uh, violence in the relationship. And on this one, I mean, I don't think anybody um, would disagree that violence in relationships is unacceptable. How do we prevent this? Well, we start with youth. Our school liaison teams work in the schools. They talk about healthy relationships. When we do find ourselves in a situation where there has been a domestic assault, we work with a victim to create a safety plan and document how they can be safer and work with our shelters and our communities. Our second priority last year was crime reduction. Much like in violence in the relationship, if we can prevent it, we can go out and uh, spend more time on more proactive stuff. Targeted enforcement of theft from motor vehicle. And a statistic that I found quite alarming when I was uh, advised of it last week was Nanaimo has had the highest spike in break-ins to motor vehicles percentage-wise in the province of British Columbia. So some of the initiatives we're doing on that right now, uh, we're going out and doing videos where we're walking along um, an area that we know gets hit and we're taking pictures of cars with license plates blocked out saying, there's a car with a purse in the front seat. Well, you don't think that window is going to be smashed? And, you know, myself, when I'm out and about, I mean, probably about five months ago, I had to go to the bank to do something on behalf of the detachment. And I got out of my police car, and as I walked to the bank, there was a car that was running with the windows down and nobody in it. And on the passenger seat was a purse. You're, you're right, Councillor. I, I, like, what am I supposed to do as a police chief? Like, I'm just a little bit perplexed here. So I, I reached in, I turned the car off, and I thought it was a bait car, but I, I know what the bait cars look like, so I knew it wasn't a bait car. <laughs> nobody was getting me on this one. Uh, so I waited a few minutes and a lady came out and I could maybe understand when she came out because this individual uh, was maybe a bit challenged. So we had a long talk, you know, very cordial and explained why I wanted to do it and she then agreed that, you know, it was probably silly on her part. She was in a hurry, but I said, hey, if it wasn't the chief of police here, next time maybe it's a bad guy and you would lose your purse, your ID and everything else in there. So. That's what we're seeing. These cars that get broken into, the iPhones are left on the thing, the iPad, the purse, the change. So uh, working on crime reduction initiatives. Our road safety initiatives, uh, enhancement for impaired driving. I've covered off impaired driving, how much it's hurting our community and everything. Uh, fortunate that, you know, one was too many, but we did have one fatal by impaired last year. Uh, but with 197 impaired charges last year, uh, it's a ticking time bomb for another one. Um, youth initiatives. So we know the priority everybody places on youth to develop a strategy, education, uh, RJ, restorative justice referrals and stuff like that. And our final one is community engagement because we want to get the community involved, uh, continue to get new volunteers in that and there. So looking forward to 2019-2020, uh, what would some of council's initiatives be? What would they think that you know we should have as our initiatives going forward? Um, anything related to bylaw, organized crime, crime trends, substance abuse, anything you think of. And what I'm hoping to do is, you know, 
get some of the priorities that are suggested by the community government groups. You know, once the priorities are selected, we operationalize them. Initiatives are developed to address the areas of concern and how we're specifically going to focus on those areas. And what I'm proposing at this time is I'd like to meet with Council in about a month from now when you've had time to digest this, because I'm not going to put you on the spot to say what your priorities are now. And I'd like to suggest that we have a meeting probably in camera to discuss some of the uh, initiatives. And at that point, I can brief you on some of the stuff that I've received from the Mayor of Lanceville, our First Nation Chiefs, and some of the community groups, because we outreach them all. Because our job is to provide service to this community, and the mission statement of the Nanaimo RCMP is to make Nanaimo the safest community in this country. That concludes my quarterly update. I'm happy to take any questions, Your Worship, from yourself or through Council through yourself. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Brown. You took yourself off the list. Oh, very good. Councillor Armstrong. Um, thank you. Um, the issues with the courts are very concerning for me, so there's, there's a couple questions, if I may, Your Worship, through you to the delegation. Uh, and I know the mayor is a strong proponent of this as well as restorative justice. Are we seeing an increase or is there a decrease in that because of um, lack of funding for restorative justice programs? So, um, Councillor Armstrong, for your worship. So, RJ referrals are actually up this year. Okay. Uh, actually, just today I signed a letter back to uh, John Howard Society, who we work with on RJs, to increase it because we're seeing a positive effect once people go through RJ program. The level of, level of recidivism uh, decreases dramatically. Uh, it's something that we do probably annual updates to our entire team on why the benefits of RJ are. It's led through our school liaison section, and as I say, we are seeing an increase in it, and it's helping overall the community. Oh, and then my second point, um, when we talk about, and, and I agree with you, I can see a lot of like uh, files not being addressed, like break and enters, et cetera, that's going to happen where the courts aren't going to look at them. Is there a way that we can play an advocacy role through our, our positions at the UBCM or FCM to advocate for more judges and court spaces? Do you think that would be beneficial? So, uh, Councilor Armstrong, for your worship. So, as an officer of the court, I can't provide direction on stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be council's decision if they choose to bring people up at UBCM or if they choose to use other means and uh, influence they have. Myself as an officer of the court, I am um, bound by what I can say and what I cannot say. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to say it was a good try, Councillor Armstrong. <laughs> Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Superintendent, for the work that you and, and the force uh, does under increasingly difficult circumstances, it appears. Um, I share the concerns about the court system, but my question relates to your statistics, which are quite alarming. Uh, and I'm wondering, is it possible to um, say to what extent the tent city situation affected the crime rate numbers that you have just presented to us? So, Your Worship, uh, to Councillor Thorpe, one of the things we have to be careful of is we want to look at the overall crime trend. We do know that the area around one port place saw a decrease in crime after that area was closed down as a tent city and the area is currently being rehabilitated now to be a bus depot. We did see an increase for calls for service in the Labio and Terminal area once those temporary shelters were, were put up. Anecdotally, is it moving? I think when you move a group of people into an area, you're going to get more issues. Um, so I'm not sure if I've answered your question or kind of if I know what the question is. I, I'm not sure that the question can be answered, but just noting the, the increase in the number of files uh, of different descriptions, I just wondered if, if you could pinpoint that at least a, a significant amount of that was attributable to the tent city uh, situation, and, and maybe you, you can't. So with respect to that, we do, when we deal with people and they are charged with offenses, um, we do know their addresses. We don't publish those, obviously, and you know, it would be remiss for me to say that everybody living at uh, 123 Any Street mm. commits crime and nobody else in the city does. So um, I can say that you know, the calls for service in the area of uh, Labio and terminal housing sites, the calls for service have gone up. Um, you know, just taking a quick look at my numbers here, you know, assaults are up by 83%, uh, bike thefts up by 22%, break and enters to business up 50%. Um, you know, a number of other type of files up. Um, so that anecdotally, you could say that would probably, is there a cause and effect? You might be able to anecdotally say that. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to Superintendent Miller. Uh, I'm looking at your looking forward slide, and uh, you mentioned um, bylaws in there. Can you describe to me what bylaw 
is done by the RCMP, what bylaw work is done, and maybe what percentage of your force is devoted to that? So one of the things as a um, police officer in the province of British Columbia, we can enact force bylaws if we want. There are times when bylaws become more effective way of enforcement and dealing with the situation. Uh, noise complaints, for example, because there's not a lot in the criminal code. But one of the things with bylaws is council may want to use a whole of government approach to solve a situation. So with the new park bylaw we have, um, there's a number of people trying to establish homeless camps and the RCMP is going out daily and working with the bylaw section. The bylaw section is enforcing the park bylaw. The RCMP is there to keep the peace. So we work with them uh, to stop and prevent a permanent tent city. So if council thinks that, hey, it'd be a good idea to do something, um, council obviously cannot enact a criminal uh, offense. That's the criminal code that's federal government. But you can enact a bylaw and the bylaw department can enforce it. The RCMP also has the ability to enforce it as well. Uh, what percentage of our time is spent on bylaws versus criminal code? I don't have a number. I would estimate no more than 2%, probably less than probably half a percent. And it's mostly to deal with liquor complaints in the downtown core for our bar watch team. Most of our bylaw work is done with the two bylaw officers um, co-located with the RCMP or with the bylaw team that are working in the parks right now. Okay, thanks. Councillor Martman. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, looking at statistics again, and this would have been the file count for January and February, so it would have been outside of Tent City. Just because I don't necessarily trust to statistics just on paper, could there have been an increased awareness and therefore you're getting more calls? Or could it be that you're catching the bad guys more? Or could there be any other factors that are involved in these statistics? So, um, Councillor Martin, through your worship. <laughs> your worship, this was not a setup, trust me. Um, <laughs> definitely it is more because one of the things we have done, and I've mentioned community advisory committees, block watch, we're telling people, much like the signs you'll see at an airport today and other high risk places, see something, say something. People are calling in now to say, hey, I'm seeing a prowler, I'm seeing something, we'll go around, we'll do a patrol. So not all of these calls are dealing with criminal code offenses, all right? As for catching bad guys, if they call up and we find the bad guys, yeah, we catch them, we arrest them. And um, Hollywood got it right that we always get our man. So, but the calls for service don't necessarily mention or uh, reflect the number of criminal code offenses. Right. But generally, you are seeing a spike in those as well because, as I mentioned, some of the things, uh, B&Es, um, assaults, stuff like that is on the rise in both those areas. But we've sort of seen a bit of a plateau in that, um, both around both those sites because with Pacifica and Island Crisis Care starting to develop their own policies and they're evicting people that are causing problems because the majority of those people just want to be there and they don't want to cause problems. Are there some people that do want to cause problems? Anywhere I go, there's somebody who wants to cause a problem, right? So if we can just get those people out and work with the other ones, which we do. Yeah. May I just, uh, you bring up a good point. So when they evict those with criminal activities or are not good tenants, um, they go into the street, I'm assuming. They become homeless. Generally, some of them go in the street, some of them move to a different community and you start all over again there. Okay. You know, there are some people that uh, will become evicted from these places and they can't go to the shelters because there's a number of shelters in town, but some people get banned from the shelters due to mental health problems or acting out or violence or aggression. And it's interesting, you know, I mentioned that we are working with um, bylaws to keep the parks clean right now to move people along in um, BC Court of Appeal and Adams versus the City of Victoria, people can take shelter from 7 p.m. to 9 a.m. They can take shelter. They can't camp, they can take shelter. shelter. Now if their shelter happens to be in a tent, that's fine, but nine o'clock in the morning, they've got to move along and that's what we're doing with people. We're moving along in the morning. And we want to make sure that, you know, we don't end up in a situation like last summer, because I mean, there was a lot of strain on the city, my resources, city resources and funding as well. Thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Through the chair, uh, thank you. And I'm uh, just curious, um, looks like a lot of the increase in crime is you know, obviously uh, drug-related, drug substance abuse-related. Uh, are our stats 
uh, on par with, say, what Victoria is experiencing, Kelowna, like other places in the province, or are we experiencing a, a more concentrated effect of the, the drug trafficking, the stolen property? Uh, sorry, sorry, that, that I, I don't know with respect to uh, Cologne and Victoria stats, so I haven't compared those. I do know, uh, as I mentioned, that we've had the highest percentage increase of break-ins to vehicles. Whether that's going to fund uh, drugs or not, I don't know. I do know that every crime, with the exception of crime of passion, is committed for financial gain. So people are looking for money, and what are they looking for money? To support lifestyle. Generally, it's a drug sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that uh, my colleague in Victoria, uh, Chief Maddock, has said that he's got a homeless issue, he's got a drug issue, and he's got a number of issues. Um, my colleagues in Kelowna, Kamloops, PG, Langley, which are same size communities, which I you know, speak with my um, fellow chiefs regularly, um, everybody is experiencing an upward trend in crime stats. Yeah, whether it's uh, specific to drug or specific to other things, um, we don't know, but we do know that organized crime does have a strong hold in a number of our communities. Thanks. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Um, just another follow-up. I'm just really concerned about the impaired driving because I think that's really significant. Like, I think that's higher than I've seen in, in years. Do these stats only include Nanaimo or would Ursu stats be included in this? Or is this just Nanaimo detachment stats? No. So, so uh, Councillor Armstrong, your worship. So that's a good question. No, those are just City of Nanaimo stats based on uh, 503 and 5022. So there's a specific Nanaimo codes. It has nothing to do with Ursu. Ursu has their own statistics. And I didn't run those because, uh, what I, I suppose maybe I could for next time, uh, because the provincial unit, if they do na nail somebody within the community, they track those and that is counted as a provincial statistic. But I, and you gotta be careful there because if you count it as a provincial statistic and you count it here, then you're actually double counting it. No, so you that, wanna make sure that you don't double count. That's just fair. I just, I just think like from, from my perspective, that's an absolute huge increase because impaired had been on the decline and now it looks like it's it's, it's going the wrong way. It, it, it is. It's, it's the first time I've seen it uh, trending here in yeah. uh, the four years I've been here, and it is uh, quite distressing. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Superintendent Miller. I have a few questions myself. Um, I think your comment around the, uh, the, the management and operation of the uh, two uh, facilities on Labio and Terminal uh, is accurate in terms of how they started, but uh, there are improvements, and I think uh, Council's heard of some of those improvements. Uh, and so I want to ask you if it's possible for you to comment. Are we seeing now a decrease in the surrounding areas? Notwithstanding that the numbers you've given us tonight show an increase, those are statistics running from December, January, February, March. Are we now at the end of March better off than we were at the end of February? Can you comment on that? If you can't, that's fine, but if, if you can, I'd be interested. No, Your Worship, I can't comment on that. What we're seeing right now is a plateau. So we're not trending up, but we're not trending down. So we're plateauing, and I'm hoping with this new crime initiative that will be launched probably in the next two weeks with a uh, task force that we're going to start to see stuff go down. Um, yeah, we're plateauing right now. And, and is, is it fair to say that um, it's a smaller portion of, of the homeless population and, and, uh, and, and particularly those with, with brain injuries who are uh, responsible for a significant portion of the crime. I mean, I don't, you know, it defies common sense and I'm not gonna pretend that uh, the public wouldn't generally agree with this proposition that uh, much of this crime appears to be related to drug addiction and mental health issues, a combination thereof. Uh, supporting drug habits, people who have been trying to medicate away their, their mental health issues. Uh, but, you know, we are hearing from various people that there are some who are, are so brain damaged that the concept of incarceration is meaningless, that there is no hope of successful treatment, uh, and there is no help of real rehabilitation because their brains are in such a state that that's not going to work. And I wonder if you can offer some comment uh, tonight around that and, and what percentage or, or what portion of the, of the crime that's occurring may relate to those people who, I don't mean incorrigible in the sense that they're making a conscious decision, they don't have enough capacity anymore to make decisions. So a uh, number of questions there, Your, your Worship. So the first one, um, and as you know, asked sort of earlier by Councilor Gesselbrecht, so the number of uh, percentage of crimes related to drugs and mental health, uh, 
we don't actually track, you know, if people are having mental health issues. Anecdotally, we know that a number of these people are. Do a number of these people, um, are they not cognizant enough to know what they're doing? Um, some of the people that are acting erratically and uh, that will take to the psychiatric evaluation center for an evaluation and see if somebody will section 28 them under the Mental Health Act, um, we work with VIHA on this. And VIHA as a partner, um, Sometimes, you know, the, the attending physician says, no, this person can be released, and sometimes they say they can't. Uh, I've seen situations where people are released, uh, which I don't think they should be, but that, I'm not a medical professional, uh, but they go back and don't commit a crime again. So, you know, whether these people are beyond uh, treatment or something, that'd be a question best posed, I think, to Biha versus myself, but we do see a number of, um, as the airline calls them, frequent flyers. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you very much for the good work of yourself and your members. Thank you, Marshal. Further delegations. Um, we have a delegation from ACE Nanaimo regarding downtown Nanaimo. Please come forward, introduce yourselves, and uh, you have five minutes, and I'm re relatively ruthless on that, but the question period is another matter. Hi. Uh, we're Ace and Imo. We're a group of third-year graphic design students at VIU. I'm Sarah. I'm Michaela. I'm Nigel. And I am also Sarah. Uh, so this group was formed as part of our environmental design class. So in that class, we came downtown and we looked at downtown Nanaimo and what we could do to brighten up the area. So we were basically tasked with giving downtown Nanaimo a revitalization, and we had our project seen and critiqued by the Masters of Community Planning students. They liked a lot of what we had, so we thought, why not bring it here? Oops, uh, so I we didn't chose start the, the timer right away, so it looks like you may have a little more time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we chose the acronym uh, ACE, so it stands for Activate, Connect, and Engage. Uh, this campaign is meant to activate engagement not only through tourists coming into Nanaimo, but within our city as well. Uh, we believe that if we can implement these ideas, we'll be able to connect more as a community. So Nanaimo actually already has an art wall in the downtown, but we'd like to see this idea taken to the next level. Uh, we recommend putting an art wall in Diana Crawl Plaza and having community events hosted by the city at this location. Um, by having staffed events, it allows for a safe location for members of the community of all ages to explore their creative side. Um, our plan also included an art wall as part of a much larger skate park installation in Maffeo Sutton. Um, obviously, this is something fairly lofty, but even if the skate park doesn't make the cut, we feel that an art wall installation there would be very successful. So currently, Diana Crawl Plaza is full of potential, but isn't quite living up to it. And while we think the art wall would definitely liven up the location, a community garden has the potential to turn the plaza into a hub. Our vision, is, uh, uh, our vision is for a community garden that is open to anyone and that gives back to everyone. Ideally, the garden would be partnered with a local charity with a certain percentage of all crops being donated to help feed Nanaimo's less fortunate. Um, in order to keep the garden easy to access, plots will be booked using an application um, so that unlike other community gardens, it won't require a manned station. All rules and guidelines for the garden will be readily available on the app and online. So the ACE Nanaimo app acts as an online hub to connect users to Nanaimo. While doing research for this project, we realized that most citizens do not have a good understanding of the events that are happening in the community. So the app will feature an easy to use events calendar where all events can be compiled into one place and allowing users to engage with the community more. The app also will also feature a map, bus schedules, and other helpful information to allow both citizens and tourists to make their way around town. And of course, as we've already mentioned, the app will help manage the community garden. Uh, so we'd like to thank you for listening to us. Um, we have some handouts for you with more in-depth information about our project and ideas, and we hope to see some of them make their way into downtown Nanaimo. Uh, thank you, and perhaps some um, you can, <laughs> we can get them handed out so while we still have an opportunity for questions, it might assist in 
inspiring members of council to ask questions. Councillor Armstrong. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. That's excellent. Um, it's interesting that you looked at the app because our staff actually did do a report last year to um, do exactly that, and they applied for, for grants, unfortunately didn't make it. But a great initiative. I think it's awesome, and thank you very much for bringing it forward. Thank you. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, I just want to share with you that as council, we often um, we're wrestling with these big issues of what to do with downtown, what to do with Diana Crawl Plaza, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't often get delegations coming and saying, what about this or what about that? So I just want to thank you for this. This is really exciting to have university students sharing with us their ideas for growing our city. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kesselbrook. Through the chair, I just also wanted to really say thank you for your initiative of coming up here today and presenting. That's really cool, and yeah, keep it up. Thanks a lot. Um, as you can see, the booklets have quite a bit more information, so yeah, feel free to look at it. Um, we hope you like some of the ideas. You can always contact us later. Um, I, I know I've been uh, talking back and forth a little bit, getting everything set up for tonight, so yeah. And, and, and for the sake of completeness, it's Nigel Newfelt, uh, Michaela Binda, Sarah Holmes, and Sarah Vowles, correct? Yes. For purposes of playing by the rules. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship, and through the delegation. Um, have you put any budget to this thing or seen how, what we, how we could actually implement it? We had one class with them and we thought it would be a good idea to get their input because I know they spend a lot more time on that side of things um, to further our ideas. Yeah. Councillor Bartman. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, just um, because you may know more than me, the visitor's centre, through to staff, do we not have a visitor centre downstairs in the conference centre anymore? I think we might, but the problem is that we don't know. Um, I think that like speaks for itself, actually. Um, the fact that we don't know about it and we don't really have like a visual, like big thing for people and tourists to see when to we see. they come into town, right? So I that's agree. kind of what we were thinking there. I agree. We need one downtown too. Right. Thank you. Like, I think there's an information center on the highway, but it doesn't really catch anyone who's coming into. Yeah, downtown. that was for the motorhomes yeah. going to Tofino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's not very welcoming to your house if you don't have a front door for someone to knock on. <laughs> Dan said it's, thank you. A, it's in the bastion. If no one else, thank you very much. Appreciate the time and, and the interest and the initiative shown here today. Thank very you. Very kind. Thank you. The next is a delegation from Innovation Island. Please. And the usual, if you'll introduce yourselves and yourself. Uh. Sure. sure. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor and Council. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, here today. Um, there's, there's been a lot of uh, excitement and I think uh, perhaps a tad bit of confusion on uh, tech and innovation within our, our community and our region. And so I thought I'd take the opportunity to quickly explain a little bit about our structure and some of the programs and services that we deliver. Um, first and foremost, uh, Innovation Island is a non-profit industry association. Uh, we've been actually in Nanaimo for 20 years. Um, it used to be called MISTIC, Mid-Island Science and Technology. And, and over the course of that time, we've done some rebranding. Uh, we've worked with a variety of uh, provincial and, and federal agencies. Uh, currently, we're working under something called Innovate BC. Innovate BC is a crown corporation of the province. It used to be called the BC Innovation Council or BCIC. Some uh, change of government, some new branding, very similar programs and services. The basic structure of Innovate BC is really to provide a, a, a portal or a conduit to, to funding and idea development and working with industry expertise in a whole host of programs and services for the developing tech community in, in our entire province. And they've recently put together a new site that really covers a lot of resource materials that we're using uh, here in Nanaimo and throughout the region every day. Now, the delivery of, of these programs are through what we, what, what we call the, the BC Acceleration Network. So these are 
tech-based uh, incubators and accelerators, and these are some of our counterparts uh, across the province. So the region is divided up generally by a population map, as, as governments tend to do provincially and, and, and federally, and these are just some of the partners that, that we work with uh, every day. Um, one of the big new items for Innovate BC is the, the BC Tech Summit. And that's been, I believe, running now for four years and it's building. And this particular summit that happened last March, they put together something called regional houses. The idea there was to take the five primary regions of the province and have some of the new up and coming companies show and present there. So we had uh, a great opportunity to kind of uh, lead the charge with one of the best locations on the conference floor, and that was an exciting thing under that particular mandate. Now, when, when we zoom out to a global perspective, and, and tech in this era is really a, a global thing, it's a massive $3 trillion a year industry. Uh, the country takes about 4% of that activity uh, at 120 billion, and the province is about 20% of a federal uh, uh, perspective. I was going to do a pie chart on this, but it would be a bit too humbling because the global industry is just so darn big. Uh, but that's a little reference to, to the size of the industry. Now, when we get to, to our mandates in our region, um, I kind of lovingly refer to it as something called the ROI. I say we focus intensely on the ROI, which is the rest of the island. Uh, the, the idea there is that uh, aside to Victoria, we cover a big geography. We are covering everything but Victoria, including the Sunshine Coast. When you, when you do a little population map around that, that's about 400,000 people in both of those jurisdictions, and, and we cover uh, that area. Our primary offerings are, are generally programs, uh, industry intelligence, various resources and events. Um, I get asked a lot, you know, what's the makeup of our regional relationship? Well, sometimes we have collaboration. Collaboration is easy to say, but hard to do. Uh, we have certainly competition between communities all vying to be the next place. Uh, but I like to, to use the term co-opetition. The tech sector works with this term called co-opetition, and I could explain that later. Um, if needed. Uh, we also get asked a lot, how, how would you characterize or define tech developing in our, in our region? And I, I say it, it's random, it's circumstantial, and it's sometimes industry sectoral. What I mean by that is that a lot of folks in larger uh, cities around the world, they think, well, we're aquatech or farm tech, agri-tech. Agri it's, it's far more broad than that, and, and those are kind of my call letters for how that works. Um, I won't go through all these stats on our client profiles, but our client profiles are very exciting and, and uh, the makeup of that changes, but it, it averages out year over year pretty much like I'm showing here. For sake of time, I'll just flip to how this all translates. What, what is the regional impact? The regional impact over the past few years in particular has been quite stunning. Uh, my client base directly has, has, has achieved over $32 million of financial performance. That's broken down basically into two things, uh, invested capital and revenues. We're in lockstep almost 50-50 with that. And the thing I'm most proud of is new jobs. But 160 jobs have been created in the regional economy for sake of these outputs. Our five-year growth rate is the best in the province at 34x, as in uh, 34x. Um, our return uh, on investment in a typical sense to invested dollars from, from the province is, is stunning, and the return to the client fees, what they actually pay to be in these programs is even more stunning. So that's been a really great impact that we're just kind of getting warmed up on. Um, we get asked a lot about uh, ecosystem development. You could, uh, yeah. wrap it up. Okay, good. Sorry. That was the last one. How can we help? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I wasn't being that harsh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Councillor Turley. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship, to, you, to the, the delegation. Um, I have actually three questions, if I could, if you don't mind. Thanks. Sure. First of all, um, there's, uh, I went on your website, and, and I think I got this right. Um, there's, you have 10 clients and 13 alumni, and correct me if I, I misread that. Um, and, but it also indicated it's spread it over 15 communities up and down the island. So is there a, kind of a magic number of what specifically you're in Nanaimo, or are they evenly spread all over the island? 
Uh, thank you for that. Uh, th they're actually very evenly spread. Uh, we get asked a lot, you know, is there any particular community that's leading the charge? And my, my short answer is no. It, it's very much a regional thing. Uh, where these companies choose to be uh, is driven by all sorts of things, uh, but it's, it's pretty widespread. Great, thanks. Uh, second question, um, your mission statement refers to supporting entrepreneurs to start and grow technology companies. And my question is, do you get involved with existing larger companies or trying to attract other larger uh, entities to, to this area? The primary driver is with startups. However, we have a variety of mandates that are, are less publicized under uh, federal national research council, IRAP programs uh, for more going concern companies. And sometimes those companies uh, don't really want to be advertised about. Uh, so that, that ranges as well. And I think uh, yeah, the rest of it, I'm not sure if I can ask, so I'll, I'll pass on that. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Through you to the delegation. Um, I'm hearing slightly contradictory things, and I'm, I'll preface it by saying that we are often, um, we hear that Nanaimo is on the cusp of being maybe the next tech sector, or that there's, the potential is there, and people are really excited about that. And then I heard you say that we have 160 new tech jobs in the region, but then your slide showed that we're fragmented, it's circumstantial. I can't remember the exact wording. So, yeah. so where are we in that? Are we headed in the right direction and we're going for that new tech, kind of tech hub? Or is it we're not really a player yet? So uh, th th thank you for that. Uh, so, so from a, a provincial perspective, uh, I refer to VVK, which is Vancouver, Victoria, and Kelowna, as actually fairly defined uh, tech sectors or hubs or tech ecosystems. Um, those particular communities, for a variety of reasons which I could expand upon, uh, have kind of achieved that status uh, nationally. Internationally, not so much. Uh, but uh, this community in Nanaimo, uh, our, our regional community partners, uh, we are going in the right direction. Our growth rate uh, over the past five years is number one in the province. No one touches it, you know, 3,400 uh, percent. Victoria is growing at 30 percent. You know, so, so uh, generally speaking, uh, we are going in the right direction. It's very tough to, to, to actually say there's any one particular community in this jurisdiction that represents 400,000 people that's actually leading that charge. Uh, my clients uh, sometimes follow patterns of, of one town or another town, but they're quite widespread. Uh, when we look at, at the population breakdown of that, it's 400,000 people. Uh, the planet has 1,400 cities, larger than 400,000 uh, people. And guess what? They all want to be the next big tech hub as well. So, so we, we have to work at, at building uh, maturity and sophistication and expertise in the work that we do to get greater results. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, one of your slides talks about your partners, um, and, and none of them, I think, are even on the island. Sorry? Uh, your partners that you're partnering with. Um, do you, could you describe to me what organizations you're actually partnering with in the Nanaimo area? I cut that slide out, but we partner uh, locally with, with a lot of folks. So we do stuff with Community Futures, with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with Vaya Summit. In fact, thank you for providing this space for our tech showcase that has been uh, uh, three years running with the Vaya Summit. Um, I'm actually on the planning committee for the Vaya Summit, and, and so we we, we have partnerships, we're members of, of every chamber. Um, we're partnered with the Vicida organization, uh, EC, EC developers uh, have worked with Amrit for years uh, of the ActDev body of Nanaimo. Um, that would have been another couple of slides. Mm -hmm. um, could you, um, of the uh, amount of money and jobs and everything <coughs> that you described, could you, are you able to tell us how much of those were in their local Nanaimo, even like in the local Nanaimo area? The short answer would be no. There's certain client confidentiality uh, with the individual companies and our reporting uh, requirements to the province. So I can report on aggregated performance as I've, I've done, but I, I can't do those breakdowns that I'm aware of. I see. Okay. No more questions at this time. Councillor Armstrong. Uh, two questions through you, Your Worship. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, one, do you receive any funding from the city? Sorry? Do you receive any funding from the city? No. Okay. 
And my second question is, what do you think the biggest issue facing the NAMO in attracting the tech industry? What do you think is one of the biggest challenges for us to attract it here? I'll, I'll have to, thank you for that question. I'll, I'll have to answer that question again somewhat, somewhat regionally because uh, the slide that I sped through really uh, discussed a few challenges in, in developing an ecosystem. It, it's, it's attracting uh, talent and capital and customers and, and that's usually typically filled or fueled with uh, initial ideas. So, so, so the, the, the previous delegation, they're presenting an idea. That idea might turn out to be something that's scalable and it might turn out to be something that creates a new company. And that might turn out to be something that raises money and hires folks. So, so basically, ecosystems are built with, with great and plausible, realistic ideas. Uh, that will generally attract talent of, of, of folks that can deliver it. Uh, if there's a fighting chance to make that work, that's gonna attract some money one way or the other. And maybe they get to the point where they sell something. And if they sell something, then generally uh, they'll follow a mantra that I, I put on our website as well, was build, grow, and stay. We want companies to build, grow, and stay here. Uh, a lot of uh, other ecosystems in, internationally, they're, they're pushing aggressively to have companies get spun up and get a bunch of venture capital and then exit. And guess what? Then they'll go away. Uh, of the money that our, our clients have raised, it's all been from what we would call strategic capital, zero dollars from venture capital. Now, there's pros and cons of that, that's a larger conversation, but those are the fundamental builders. Uh, that is why Kelowna is what it is, and likewise with other larger centers. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Turley. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I remembered the third question, so. Sure, uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I noticed also from your website you have a board of four members. Uh, yes, and, yes. Um, uh, my question is, is that kind of the typical size of your board over the years, or, or is well, it... Uh... Our board has fluctuated uh, over the years, uh, as little as two up to what our bylaws account for, for 11. Okay. Um, we, we basically look for a variety of individuals to, to form our board, and, and we follow, you know, the you know, Societies Act to, to sure. you know, do that. And it's just one follow-up, if I could. So sure. is it best described as a working board or a governance board? It's a governance board. Thank you. V volunteer. Yep. Uh, thank you. I, I, just a couple of questions. Um, I noticed you said 20% of the economic activity uh, in Canada, 20% uh, is in British Columbia. Explanation for that? Any idea? Can you comment? Um, sure. So, so I, I, I do participate in a lot of provincial and sometimes some federal stuff. Uh, the, uh, we're we're, we're, we're kind of losing to Ontario and Quebec, and we're losing to Alberta. Um, Innovate BC, just don't want to get too political here, but I, they work with generally a $6 million budget. Um, there was a time when Alberta had 600. <laughs> so, you know, kind of, we're, we're, we're fighting hard to get our numbers on the board. Uh, if we're up against Waterloo, U of T, those are generally the answers. Okay. Um, Look, I mean, obviously, and, and I think you stated, or it certainly implied it, every community wants to attract the tech sector. Yeah. And everybody thinks they've got all the answers, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you can possibly comment, what, uh, what would make Nanaimo attractive to uh, anyone either wishing to set up shop, or alternatively, are there things um, uh, in terms of developing the local talent, if you will? I mean, you know, there's some bright young people you mentioned here today. I mean, I'm sure there's a few, uh, other folks in the community, students at VIU, who, who might be the, the next, um, I never know the names of these, Zuckermans or whatever, Z Bezos or all these bright yeah. young people, younger than me anyway. Uh, the Apple guy, yes. Um, but I, I'm just, I, I want to come back to the first point. What is it that we have or what things do we have that would make this attractive uh, and, and are we doing a good job of marketing that? Uh, and then secondly, are there things that we could be doing to further things that you would recommend uh, that we should be doing to increase or, or the opportunities for our homegrown talent? I mean, I'm, everybody's born somewhere. Okay, okay, so I'll, I'll try to unpack that. Thank you for that. So uh, one of the reasons why uh, some of you folks may not have heard too much about us even over the past number of years is because um, I drive a very hard ground game. 
Um, I, I know that to build tech ecosystems, and my career has been in many different places, um, you've got to have successful companies, and you've got to have quite a few of them. Uh, and you actually got to score some points at a larger level, which is actually at an international level, or you're going to pay the price for what I call fake it till you make it. Um, that's a dangerous game to play. Uh, so I focus on the ground game. I, I want to have companies build and get to, you know, let's say a humble seven figures of performance. That's a very, very tiny number in Silicon Valley. Um, and as we grow to that level, guess what happens? There are naturally occurring byproducts of attracting more talent because those companies are there and they stayed there. If we unpack the story of Kelowna, which is a longer story, uh, it happened because of that. It happened because of a solid ground game with a lot of industry intelligence and expertise to help these companies build, grow, and stay, where every once in a while you'll get an outlier like Club Penguin that gets bought by Disney, and, and Disney says, I'm not going to mess with the magic, I'm going to keep folks here, and you'll, you'll fly to us, and we'll fly to you. So fundamentals are the rules of the road for tech ecosystem development. Uh, I've lived this space for over 30 years in, in many different cities. And that's why, until I got some numbers on the board, I wasn't really interested to talk to anybody. Um, I was in Victoria just last week. It took five years to get the attention of Dan Gunn. And if any guys know Dan Gunn, with Viatech. Viatech is our brother and sisters. But until we started scoring some points and beating them on quarterly metrics, they didn't care. They didn't pay attention. So I like to poke sticks at them and say this ROI. My latest one is Greater Vancouver Island, right? So, so we got to have fun with those guys, but we've got to work a solid ground game. Councillor Brown. Yes, thank you, Worship. Um, you, you sort of indicated that a lot of places want to be the next big thing in tech. Um, and so, you know, we're going through some economic development functions. What role does the city play? Uh, how much, et cetera? Should places, such within the context of the region that you work in, actually pursue tech? Actually, should it be a focus of their economic development strategies or to um, try to create the conditions, maybe fake it until you make it? Um, this is, like, so if we're going to throw public dollars at something, um, in your opinion, would it be a good investment or a bad investment to try to grow tech in Nanaimo? This answer may seem contradictory to my day to day, but short answer is, is no. Uh, build a ground game as a community. You know, I'm sitting here hearing from Superintendent Cameron about uh, pedestrian, real challenging issues. Uh, if I heard that coming from Palo Alto and I'm going to move to Nanaimo, no, I'm not. You know, I, I want to know that there's some baseline stuff in community sustainability and lifestyle and quality. I work a ground game. You guys work a ground game. You know, when we get to the next level, maybe we'll have that conversation, you know, a little later on. But our base is here, we cover a region, it's proportionate to Victoria, we're within a provincial and federal ecosystem, we do this stuff every day. Uh, we bring a lot of expertise and relationships internationally to all of our clients to make them win. And it's, it's not easy, you know, being a tech entrepreneur is really hard. Uh, also, you gotta score pretty large numbers to just even change the conversation. So fundamentals to me are super important. Uh, just to follow up then, would it be an accurate uh, summary to say that municipalities should really just focus on good urbanism? <laughs> well, <laughs> you guys, this is your guys' job, but uh, I deal with a lot of ECDEV bodies throughout the region. I deal with different mayors and councils. I get all these questions that are pretty darn similar. Um, I work this stuff every day as does our ecosystem under Innovate BC. Um, the better communities get at the fundamentals, the better they get at, at their quality of lifestyle and their general act dev developmental stuff, uh, the better that fits to the stories that we tell. Please don't, don't, uh, don't, don't um, underestimate the stories that we do tell within our own ecosystems. It's just that my clients are playing in a different ballpark and I have to be a bit conservative with the saying, oh, look at us, we're special because uh, we're not quite there yet. So, so just again, fundamentals are pretty key. Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. That finishes the delegations. We're on to reports now. Departure Bay Waterfront Walkway Feasibility Study. Mr. Lindsay.
Take us down the walkway. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm going to turn it over here in uh, short order to Mr. Corson, who's been the project lead on the waterfront walkway. Um, but just before I do, this is uh, further to um, some information that we've previously shared with Council, and, and most importantly, recently, Council allocated uh, some money through your 2018 uh, surplus uh, to further the study and, and look at the Departure Bay section. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Corson uh, just to explain our next steps and uh, the work that we intend to do uh, this year. Great. Thanks, Dale. I'm Mr. Lindsay. So uh, tonight, Your Worship, I just want to provide you with a bit of an overview of the Waterfront Walkway project, give you some background on it, and then we'll go into some specifics about the work we've done recently and um, where we're headed. Um, and there's what we're going to talk about. So the, uh, the walkway is, the idea of creating this continuous walkway from Departure Bay to the estuary is contained in a whole number of our policy documents, whether it's our OCP, Neighborhood, Transportation Master Plan. And in the, the last two strategic plans, it was identified as a, as a priority project. And that kind of gave us the, the impetus to um, work on this implementation plan. Uh, so far, about four and a half kilometers of the walkway has been built, and it's been built over a, a series of decades, largely some bits by the Port Authority, some by private tenants in the Newcastle Channel. The city has built sections as well. And uh, until we had the actual implementation plan, it was difficult to tell or to prioritize which section would be next. And the idea of doing the plan was to lay out how you'd complete the, the entire walkway. And uh, we completed that plan through a series of public consultation in, in all of 2017. We had a number of open houses, engaged with the public. We got lots of very positive feedback and really great reception from the public, more than we had anticipated. Uh, so when the plan was adopted at the end of 2017, uh, there was also some specific projects um, and priorities for us to move forward with. The, uh, the walkway itself was, the plan was broken into six sections, which started from Departure Bay, then looked at the Newcastle Channel section, which is the blue on your screen, uh, Muffail Sutton Park, the Boat Basin, which is in purple there, the South Downtown Waterfront, and then the section from Halliburton Street all the way down to the estuary um, beyond Living Forest. So those, are, those were the six sections. And the idea we broke into the sections was so that uh, if one section came up with challenges and we weren't able to work on it, we could then put our focus onto another section. And the idea was that we continuously chip away at this project so that it didn't stall out like it had in the past and that we would make progress one way or another. Um, and I just wanted to give you, even though a lot of the focus, I think, publicly is on the departure base section, staff uh, are working on other sections of the walkway as we speak. And, and one of the interesting things with the walkway is it's also done uh, by our partners. If uh, you've been down past the Living Forest Campground recently, you'll see that there's a, the main area a lot of people walk down to the wheel has been uh, upgraded by BC Hydro as part of their right-of-way work. It's, uh, something that the city doesn't have a legal right away for, but something we can negotiate with, but the walkway has actually been built. The South Downtown Waterfront section construction started on that uh, last week, and the public will be able to walk uh, from the Gabriel Ferry Terminal down to the new entrance to the Port Authority by this summer. And that's over a, a kilometer extension. We're working on design work uh, right now for the shipyard detour section, which is going to be built uh, next year. A private developer is looking at building the section at the old nauticals on the Newcastle Channel. And we're also working with the Yacht Club to upgrade their section to a, a wider width in the, in the near future. So all those things are happening in addition to the departure base section, which um, sometimes takes the, the focus away. Uh, and I guess also a new update to that too is we heard uh, from BC Ferries last week that they've adopted their terminal development plan for the Gabriel Ferry Terminal, and it includes uh, options for the walkway to connect from Cameron Island through to One Port Drive, so that we'll be, we'll be able to get a continuous walkway along there. The, um, the, the top priority section that came out of the consultation and the implementation plan was to finish the departure base section. And, uh, if you can imagine, that's from the end of BC Ferries at the Departure Bay Ferry Terminal, all the way along to Battersea and the Kin Hut in Departure Bay. And the city updated the section, uh, the main part of Departure Bay, next to the Kin Hut a few years ago. 
in, in terms of the plan, the idea was to break it into sections and work on the, what we call the Northfield Creek section, which is from the end of BC Ferries to White Eagle uh, in Slur neighborhood, and then continue on from there to Battersea. And two options were provided uh, for building the walkway, and one was an elevated walkway, as you can imagine, on, on piles, and the other was an on-beach option. And the plan adopted said you can do either of these um, based on the feedback you get. The, uh, as we went out to the public, there was a desire to move forward with an elevated walkway uh, for the first section anyway, from the end of BC Ferries to, uh, to Solaire. So that's, oops, that's this section. And uh, through the consultation, we uh, went back out to the public and asked them for feedback in terms of design and what it could look like. And we engaged a consultant to prepare what's called a, a functional design. So it's more detailed than a concept design, but it's not the final detailed uh, engineering design you might see in some of our other capital projects. But it gives us a really good sense of the challenges with the project, what it would look like, uh, and uh, how you'd incorporate the various features. So the design that we uh, asked the consultant to work on was a 350 meter wide, uh, wide long <laughs> uh, walkway on steel piles with a width of seven uh, meters to accommodate pedestrians and cyclists in separate lanes to provide <coughs> safety. Uh, lighting, amenities such as benches, and then improved trail connections into the existing park, um, which is Beach Estates Park, as well as the existing trail down from on the Solar neighborhood. That's the design that the consultant, uh, the brief they were given, and they went off and did their design work. And the work was completed over the uh, in 2018, and I'll just show you some of the images I think people are familiar with. So this is what the, this is based on the functional design, and this was then put into SketchUp, which is a program that gives you an idea of what it might have looked like. Uh, this is a, a view from the end of the BC Ferries Terminal. This is a view uh, on the actual walkway itself. You can see the separated lane for cyclists. Uh, this is one of the viewpoints that we included in it, looking at the end from Beach Estates Park, looking out of the ferry terminal. And this would be where it would have ended at the, uh, at the White Eagle trail connection. So when the work was completed, we submitted the functional design to the province, um, as well as DFO and uh, who else was it? Uh, Nav Waters to get their approvals. We then also looked at uh, the pricing, which was more than we had initially anticipated and had, had funding for. Uh, as part of that, we thought it'd be, at this point, it'd be worthwhile to step back and take a sober second look at it, and we hired uh, a team of value engineering consultants. And, and their job was to look at the project and see if there was ways of um, reducing the price and seeing if there was other design considerations we could take into place before we advanced the project any farther. So without going into the detailed design work and spending more money, uh, seek it, get their feedback as to what we could do. And they looked at the project from a whole bunch of different angles. And they came back with one of the biggest challenges of, of the uh, elevated walkway was the constructability. And that it would be very hard to build uh, because of its location on, on, the, on the foreshore. And they were also concerned about price escalation because so much of it involves steel for the piling systems. And with the tariffs that were, uh, have just recently been introduced, it would be very difficult to uh, not, not include a significant risk element to the pricing. So they came back and said, you know, we think it might be worthwhile for you to take a step back and look at some alternative design options for this that might be, uh, that could be more, um, more cost effective and might actually have, uh, be, might be more aesthetically pleasing and could also provide um, more environmental benefits to the overall um, uh, ecosystem. And uh, they came up with two ideas. One was a uh, toe of slope, uh, which would be at the base of the, of the, of the slope in, in Departure Bay. And the other was to do a green shores approach, which is more of a, a naturalization of the beach and uh, a restoration project. And uh, I think most people are familiar with the Stanley Park Seawall, so that's an example of a, a toe of slope um, project. And then uh, a green shores approach is one where you, you um, you bring material onto the beach, but then you actually work to uh, calm the currents that come into the beach, and you plant native plantings, and you actually rebuild the whole, the whole ecosystem. So those are the two options that they thought 
uh, it'd be worthwhile exploring. And as part of that, they liked the idea of, of working on this larger ecosystem restoration piece at Northfield Creek, which would involve the intertidal area being restored and enhanced to uh, help the salmon and other wildlife. And these are just some simple concept plans that they came up with. But you can see that the walkway, while it's at the back, uh, there's actually a lot of work that gets done addition on the beach to, to help uh, restore the beach. And those are just some photos there. So the next step for us would be to move forward with what we call an RFSOQ, a request for statement of qualifications to find a team of consultants who can help us with this additional design work. The first piece would be for them to do a feasibility study, which will involve survey work, something that's called bathymetry, which is where they actually look at the, survey, uh, the elevations of the, of the foreshore under the water. Uh, coastal engineering, which looks at how the wave processes affect the, the, the walkway itself and if it's actually possible. If, if the feasibility shows that this is worthwhile pursuing, then we'll go into more functional design. And that would give council information on both the elevated walkway and the on-beach option. And if council wishes to proceed with that, uh, then we'd be looking at going to the assent of the electorates, either through a referendum or AAP, to borrow money to build the project. Um, at that point, then we would do an RFP for the actual detailed design work, and then construction would happen after that. So in terms of timing, if we issue the RFSOQ uh, in April, we'd hope that we'd have the feasibility work completed towards the end of the year, as well as the functional design work, hopefully early next year. And then in 2020, council would be in a position to have uh, the, the information to make a decision if they want to proceed uh, at all or if one of these options is more preferable. So that's all I have today for your worship. Thank you, Mr. Corson. Councillor Armstrong. Uh, thank you through you to Mr. Corson. I just have a question on, um, we just went through the spyglass thing where they have what they call it a landing strip or whatever it's called. Would that be effective there too where we would have to look at variances to build there the same as, we w as the developer would have had to there? Well, I mean, do we need a development permit? Yeah. Like, would it require the same, like, does it fall under the same guidelines that that would, like, there's what do you call it, a landing a strip or whatever it's called? The isthmus? Mm. What is it? What do you call it? Leave strip. strip, yeah. Right. This is all on the foreshore, so it's a bit different. There, There is no... Uh, so there's none? We there isn't. about that? Well, there is approval, so certainly the idea is you have to be able to build a case uh, for this project to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and, and to the province. And they're, they're the ones that ultimately sign off on it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. Corson, thank you very much for the update. I think, uh, I think our community has, has made it clear uh, that they support this project in principle as an exciting addition to, uh, to our downtown. And, uh, and I do as well, recognizing that uh, the entire project will will take many years to complete, and uh, some of it is easier than others. Um, the cost of the raised walkway was definitely a concern, and that's a concern I share, so I'm very pleased that you're uh, looking at the alternate of uh, the, uh, the Green Shore approach, for example, and I'll look forward to hearing more uh, information about that in the future. I'm also really pleased to hear that we're moving ahead with the smaller sections that are the easy wins and gradually uh, knocking those off and getting those completed. And I was especially interested, Mr. Corson, in, in uh, your comment about the Gabriola Ferry. Uh, because for me personally, uh, a priority section of this has always been uh, from Cameron Island to Port Place, heading that direction. So I wondered if you could just elaborate more on the information that you've received regarding the, the ferry situation. Um, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, through, to, through the worship to Councillor Thorpe, sorry. Um, so I just had a conversation last week with their manager of terminal development for BC Ferries. And uh, Mr. Lindsay and I were talking about it might be worthwhile to have BC Ferries come in and actually do a presentation to Council to present the plan and, and update you on that. It's, it's very exciting and uh, a substantial investment in Nanaimo. And uh, uh, the, it's... Right now, they're looking at construction in 2020, 2021. So it ties in very nicely with all the stuff we're doing in the South Downtown Waterfront. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd probably prefer if they would speak to it rather than myself. Very exciting. Thank you. Look forward to that. I think uh, we've all received today an inquiry from a very active citizen who's often uh, 
uh, full of a great deal of advice and, and suggestions for council. And, and I'm just wondering, um, just to review, I think this information has already been made available in other reports. Uh, what's the rough cost and timeline to finish, if you will, all of the, the little chunks that still exist between uh, Sutton Maffeo, if you will, uh, to the ferry terminal itself? That's a good question. I'm um, just doing the math in my head. It's probably... I'm sure they're watching, so... I know. Uh, and, and you can answer it at <laughs> so another So take my occasion. number and add, take my number and times it by two. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say two to three million. Yeah. Uh, because the, their polite suggestion was they'd rather see us spend money on that first rather than borrow money to do the... Uh, what is identified, I think, is the public's priority section, which, of course, is the ferry terminal through to Departure Bay. Uh, yes, Your Worship, and, and one of the challenges of that section is that because we don't actually have physical control over those properties because the majority of them are tenants of either the Port Authority or the province, uh, we have a limited ability to influence when those those come in. So whenever they, there is an opportunity, we, um, we, we do our best to bring them forward, and that's why that area has been done in a piecemeal, piecemeal manner. So we'd certainly, we look forward to working with our partners to advance it as much as we can. Yeah. Councillor Armstrong has another question. Yeah, just one more. Um, would it be fair, when we were doing the public consultation at the time, the cost was never given to the public, right? When they did their, um, like this piece, that piece, it was just like, which do you like to see? And there was no cost factors? Yeah, no, no, we, um, we actually did provide costs to the so public. So like the 10 million was there for the uh, raised? We actually showed a number of, um, I'm sorry, just hang on a sec. We showed a number of 15.5 for the elevated and seven on for the beach. Oh, okay, thank you. And that was the initial con consultation? That was the initial implementation plan, where again, we're very conceptual. Okay, thank And you. even with those numbers, people came back and supported the elevated. Awesome, so, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Corson, following what Councillor Thorpe said, for what it's worth, uh, I, the, the Green Shores approach looks most appealing to me, uh, most sensitive to the environment, and everyone's very conscious of that, and it's also a heck of a lot cheaper. I can't say that the elevated walkway notwithstanding, and I say, state this publicly and will be stand and will and will, will be prepared to be hung for it. The cost of the elevated walkway uh, and the physical appearance of it notwithstanding, apparently 60% of people supported it. It is not one that, that excites me nearly as much. And uh, like, uh, like Councillor Thorpe, I want to thank you and, and the staff for continuing to work on this project and, and, uh, and pursue it on behalf of the good citizens of the Nime. When I've inspired Councillor Bonner to say something now, or I'm sure he's inspired on his own. Well, thank you for that lead-in. Um, actually, it was mostly a question uh, to staff, if I may. Um, in terms of the elevated walkway, what would the lifespan of such a... Um, a an, a structure B as opposed to the lifespan of a green short? It's a, it's a good question. The, the elevated walkway does, uh, does need maintenance and does need to be replaced. We were looking at around about a 50 to 60 year lifespan of, for the walkway. And then the, the green shores needs, depending on how it's designed, needs, needs maintenance. And because uh, the idea is you're essentially recreating a beach and it will erode over time. And the idea is you actually want the sand to actually move along and nourish the beach. So from time to time, you do have to come in and actually re-nourish the beach. So it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, maintenance cost. And we'll learn more about that through the study because uh, they'll, they'll get an idea of how often you have to do it and how much and mm -hmm. the cost and stuff. Okay. Thank you. So moved. Second. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. Report be received. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carried. Thank you very much. The next is the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner findings and recommendation. Ms. Gurry. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. I'll try to be less dramatic than I was this afternoon. <laughs> um, so the report in front of you um, this afternoon, or this evening now, is to provide Council with an update on the recommendations of the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner. So in August um, of 2018, the Information and Privacy Commissioner Michael McAvoy presented a number of recommendations to the City of Nanaimo after he wrapped up his investigation. 
And this report outlines those recommendations and progress that staff has made implementing those recommendations and moving forward. And it's also asking that council endorse staff's initiatives to endeavor to comply with these recommendations um, that, that the Information and Privacy Commissioner did provide as one of the recommendations was a privacy management program. And there's a number of building blocks that are included in a privacy management program. Um, anywhere from tools like privacy impact assessments to um, privacy policies, which a draft is included with this, your report this evening too. Um, but the number one kind of first step is executive level support from a council or a board and also your senior management team. So that is why we are asking for your endorsement of our initiatives and your continuing support while we work through this. Thank you very much, Ms. Gouri. Move and recommendation, Councillor Bonner, seconded, Councillor Martman. Any quick discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, motion carried, thank you very much. Electric vehicle charging station grant opportunity follow-up. Mr. Sims, good evening. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, good evening. Uh, we're, as directed by Council at the last meeting, we've returned to provide a bit more clarification around the grant program for electric vehicle charging stations. Again, I'd like to apologize for the confusion that I created uh, with the last meeting. It was my misunderstanding of how the program was structured. Um, so in fact, to end, answer the fundamental question that came up was that the RDN's program will fund 10 stations. The city is proposing an additional four stations. That was in the report, but it was again my confusion, so I apologize. Um, so the other question that, that arises is the, uh, the grant program itself, which is closed as of March the 27th, uh, but that was with the regional district as the, the lead applicant, and the regional district is kind of that sort of overarching uh, group, and a number of municipalities across the entire island, not just within uh, the RDN, a number of municipalities are participants in that grant program. So we have an additional month as a participant to provide further information. That includes locations and so on and so forth. Um, and it also includes a council resolution, which is why we're here in front of you tonight. So uh, Mr. Rose, I brought Mr. Rose along, who's a little more intimately familiar with the program and, and he's prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Does someone want to move the motion first, then we'll ask questions, or do you want to ask questions sure. now? Councillor so moved. So moved. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. Questions for Mr. Rose? We're eminently satisfied. You don't get your moment in the sun tonight. Oh, sorry, Councillor Bonner. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to staff. Um, I guess so. We can only get four. We can't get ten. Uh, is that what? Because this is what we we talked about at the RDN. Um, so we're, there's no chance of us just getting another six out of that same program at this late date. Uh, through your worship, I would say it's possible, but we would need to go back and look at our budgets and determine whether or not we have the capacity to, to try and um, um, secure additional locations. The reason I was asking is since the, this organization is paying for the vast majority of it, it would be you know, wise spending of money, which I believe we could easily take this out of surplus or some other place uh, where we have extra money because it's not operations and we would have 10 plus whatever RDN decides to stick in this area. Um, and I would certainly like to see them in more visible areas so that people realize that they can charge cars and then we'll go out and buy cars. Uh, specifically, as come up recently um, in Vancouver, is many of the um, buildings where people are living that may be a strata are having trouble getting charging stations put in and some of the buildings actually don't have the electrical capacity to provide these stations. So it would be, I think, incumbent upon municipalities to provide some of these as well. Mr. Sims. Your Worship, thank you. Um, one of the, uh, the comments that we've, we've discovered or, or 
Mr. Rose has touched on his report is that there's a lot of uh, available stations for the public that the city doesn't actually control. So part of, part of what drove the, the selection of four um, charging stations here was that was with the, the budget capacity that we had, uh, let alone the staff capacity to sort of plan and, and implement these. Um, part of our uh, upcoming active transportation strategy will include a more of a strategy around electrical electric vehicle charging stations. So the goal is certainly to, to have more and more stations all the time, but at the same time, uh, to to put them in a reactive mode is you know maybe not the best way of, of getting getting these installed. So we felt four was a good balance. We can we can get those in, um, but that's in the absence of a, a larger strategy. Thanks, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. I just have a couple questions. Um, we were saying that we're going to allocate up twenty four thousand. Then it says amend the plan for eighty thousand. Is that including the 24,000 or is that an additional? And then my last question is, from the perspective of what we're paying, like doing the math, I got we're roughly from the NAMO taxpayers will be paying $136,000. Is that correct? Towards this, which is a 0.13% tax increase. So I'm just asking that question because we do pay 60% of the funding for the RDN, correct? And then if we're asking to pay that amount of money, it takes us quite up high. This is including private. Mr. Rose, uh, um, through your worship, no, so hmm? uh, the city will be paying for twenty-four thousand. The eighty thousand dollars is uh, an, ex an accounting exercise. Sorry, I, I didn't hear you. Somebody was speaking. The, so the city would, will be paying twenty-four thousand okay. dollars. The eighty thousand dollars is a notation for our accounting. We need to ultimately amortize or um, uh, amortize. Capitalize, sorry, um, the investment in these in these stations, so that when at the end of life we have allocated enough money to renew them or repair them or replace them. So the capital investment for the city will only be twenty four thousand. What what comes from the um, uh, the RDN? Uh, I can't speak to. No, I just I was confused because it says amend the plan for eighty thousand dollars. So that's why I was confused. So and then. Yeah, so the, so the $80,000 and then there's a grant contribution which makes up the difference between the 24 and 80. So that's what the bylaw will. Okay. Right, and, and my last question is, um, are those going to be free as well or will people have to pay for them? Yep, yeah, they will be Okay, free. thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Through the chair to Mr. Rose. Uh, Mr. Rose, thank you uh, for uh, taking advantage of this opportunity in a, in a measured way. I appreciate you uh, showing up to the RDN uh, meeting when this was first presented and uh, putting forward the, the city. Um, just uh, in the installation, I know that uh, there's a larger uh, charging station plan being uh, crafted, and I'm sure this conversation is happening with the uh, the Community Energy Association, but uh, if it is possible just to outfit uh, the stations that we're uh, going to be installing, um, you know, initially they uh, they can be free uh, to incentivize use, um, but that they're outfitted to be able to charge through, through the station. I know there's models that uh, you can do that if we so choose to down the road uh, to, to recover costs in that, so thank you. So through your worship, um, at this time, we're actually still waiting to hear back from utilities commissions on whether or not we can charge. So mm -hmm. um, at this point in time, they will remain free, mm -hmm. so. The growing list, Councillor Turley. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you, worship, you through to uh, um, staff. Is there any anticipated maintenance costs regarding these four stations? Through the mayor, uh, there will be uh, ongoing maintenance at times, but uh, to date, the stations we've had, it's actually been quite low. So, okay. And if I could just make one further comment, I, <clears throat> I, I don't like that word "free" because it's to me it's a four-letter word. Being a business person, but anyway, um, I, my concern about doing it on a on a free basis, regardless of what Councillor Councillor Gastelbeck said, is that. At some point in time, when the market becomes more considerable than it is now, 
there's a likelihood of private enterprises wanting to get involved in it, and I deem that would be unfair competition. That's all I'm going to say. Thanks. Councillor Brown. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, just so I understand this through you to staff, uh, 80K will be, has to be, the budget needs to be amended because we need to put the 80K um, to account for the installation, uh, but then we will receive 56,000 back uh, from the grant, which essentially results in only 24,000 uh, being paid out from the city of Nanaimo taxpayer. Is that correct? Denver, your worship, that's correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. And just one quick note at the regional district, it wasn't identified where the funding would be coming from, and that was part of the messiness around um, uh, how it came to be. Um, and so there was a variety of sources put out there, such as community work funds, which n would not impact the city of Nanaimo taxpayer, it, depending on the area and et cetera. Thank you, everyone. Uh, are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Contrary. Councillor Armstrong, duly noted, contrary. Motion carried. Question period, Ms. Gurry. Do we have anything? We have nothing. I would now like a procedural motion to proceed in camera. Moved Councillor Hemmins, seconded Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Contrary. Motion carried. We will retire to the Rispin Room. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>